Morning, everyone. My name is Jordan Schubach. I'm the Director of Communications for the City of Amarillo, and I want to thank you for coming this Saturday morning and spending some time with us. We're here today to talk about conceptual ideas for the improvement and expansion of the Amarillo Civic Center complex. And I'm glad you're here because the entire process we've built is designed to get citizen feedback and input on the program, on the concepts, on the, uh, the imagery that you see. We are interested in hearing if it's too big, too small, too much, not enough of anything like that. The, the goal being to build something that is, is built based on citizen feedback. So thank you for coming and spending your time here this morning. Um, we'll have some information in the back when you're all are done. When we're done here, we'll have uh, lots of great presentations and information. Please take a booklet. We'll also have a tour for those that want to walk through the uh, Civic Center when we're done. And um, uh, lots of opportunities to ask questions and provide the feedback that we're looking for. So with that, I would just want to welcome you one more time to uh, Conversation Civic Center. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is David Lovejoy, and I'm part of the Citizens uh, Executive Committee for the Civic Center. Uh, nine months ago, we were asked to come together as citizens and look at what this city council and the city's been looking at for probably nine years, and that's replacing this building that we're sitting in. Um, we can use words like antiquated, inadequate, obsolete, and that might be my dating profile opening, but it's also describing this civic center. Think back, think back a little bit. 1964, right here in Amarillo, Texas. Our economy took a huge blow. One of the largest economic engines that we had decided we're leaving. The Air Force Base says we're, we're getting out of Amarillo, Texas. We were devastated in this community. But the, the people who came before us, the people who, who were part of this city, sat down and said, we need something to improve the quality of our life. We need something to make us the show place and the leader that we are in the Texas Panhandle. And they decided to build this building, the Amarillo Civic Center Complex. That was 52 years ago. It opened in 1968, the first night, was a gospel concert with the Oak Ridge Boys. The second night was Glen Campbell, a sold out house. We come to today. Our building is not a functional building anymore. If you've come to this Civic Center for a function or a trade show or an event, you've seen the limitations of our building. Rooms spread out. No front of meeting space, no back of house, no kitchen, no service areas. One of the main things that hurts us is the size of the Coliseum. When this building was built in 64, it was state of the art. That meant the ceiling from the floor to the ceiling was 38 feet. Today, the standard is 60 feet. And we have artists. And, and events who want to come to Amarillo. And, and we ask them, the, the staff of the Civic Center, which is really what we sell to people, it's not the building, it's the staff and our Amarillo hospitality. They say, well, we're only gonna get 5,000 people in here. And huge artists like Cher and, 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 and Marvel and Ice Cafe say, that's fine. We want to come and perform for 5,000 people. But then they get the specs of our Coliseum and things they have, their stages, their equipment, don't fit. And they're not gonna take time to break everything down, rebuild it, put it in our Civic Center, break it back down and go on down the road. That's three days they're not touring and making money. So it's not effective and cost, the value's not there for these promoters and these issues. If you look at some of the amenities in the Civic Center, Bathrooms are not of the best quality. Food service, breezeways, handicap areas, they're not up to par. And it takes away from the experience. We see in Hodgetown, 80% of people who go to see a sod poodle game aren't diehard baseball fans. They go for the experience. I think about a night up in Hodgetown when I'm in the press box 
And I look out over the crowd, and I see the glows of cell phones staring back at people. Today, kids want to be entertained all the way around. They want Wi-Fi. They want activity. They want great food. We can do none of that here in this Civic Center. Now, I was born and raised in this city. I saw some great things and some great memories made right here in this Civic Center from brothers and sisters and relatives and my own son, myself, graduating high school here. Today, we have to make families choose who's going to see their children graduate. Grandparents, uncles, aunts. We have to decide, well, I only got four tickets because of the size of our building. When you come in this building as a kid, I, I saw the Harlem Globetrotters play here. I saw the escapade, escapades. I saw two NBA Hall of Famers play on that court with Larry Bird and Maurice Cheeks. The first concert I saw, Billy Squire and Cheap Trick, I saw right here in this, this, this Civic Center. It holds a lot of meaning and holds a large place in our hearts. About a month ago, well, a week before Father's Day, my mom's little brother, Tommy Reasonover, a lifelong Amarillo citizen, was diagnosed with cancer. And I went and visited my Uncle Bo for a month. In 1956, he was a Navy seaman, and he was about to get out in 60, and he said, I'm going to go home for a month and see if I want to live in Amarillo. And when he got back to San Diego to his shipmates, my uncle died about 30 days ago. When he got back to his shipmates in San Diego, they said, reason over, what are you going to do when you get out? You going to stay in California? He said, man, I'm going back to Amarillo. That city's on the go. We need that same spirit. We need that same drive and determination that we're going to be that progressive city that's going to be on the go. And with this project of changing the Civic Center, making it a show place, we can put Amarillo back as that jewel in the crown of the panhandle. Now. Everybody here, when we started nine months ago, we were on a fact-finding mission. And that's what you're here to do today. I encourage you to take the tour of the building, ask questions, and be a part of this. Thank you for being here this morning. Hi, thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Dr. Aaron Pan. I'm executive director at the Don Harrington Discovery Center. Uh, but I'm also uh, proudly a board member of the CVC. And uh, being a board member of the CVC, I get to see the amazing dedication, professionalism, and hard work that all of that staff does to bring in amazing business uh, conventions and tours here to the Civic Center and to Amarillo. And they do it with their kindness, with their flexibility with their going beyond uh, what would usually be considered necessary, uh, but they also are doing it basically uh, being hindered, and they're being hindered because of the capacity that's right now available for the Civic Center. So often when they visit with vendors, the vendors are interested, they like the staff, they really think they like the affordability, they like how uh, where Amarillo is and, and what they can do, but then they start to see what they have to do to accommodate to actually come here. And that instead of saying, look what amazing options we have for you, they have to basically accommodate to us. We're not accommodating to them. And so in many cases, that's why we are losing uh, a number of different uh, possible businesses and uh, visits and conventions that we could have. Uh, one of those, we're going to get to go through some examples the uh, Texas Association of Collegiate Registrars and Admission Officers, which typically has between 650 to 700 attendees, which would make, which would give us 1,300 room nights uh, for just one of those visits. They typically only have a couple dates a year to, that, they, that they would want to use us, 
Well, both of those dates this year are full because we have other events here. If we had a larger facility, we'd be able to not only host those events, but we'd also be able to host uh, this association. Uh, we were very excited this year. We had the first robotic competition district event. Uh, we have, and they're actually signed up for three-year agreement. They had 2,000 attendees, and we're really excited about that, and that was able to do 500 room nights. But they actually want more. They have more modules. They would like to do it more often here, but we can't do that with the capacity that we have. Uh, we also are, you know, where we're located centrally, we're located on I-40, I-27. We're in basically for agriculture. We're a perfect area for a lot of places. It's basically low-hanging fruit for where our location is. Uh, so the U.S. Custom Harvesters have been here, um, and they really like it, but their convention has been growing and growing, and they need more room for their vendors, and we are no longer at that capacity that they need. And so instead of being able to sort of lock it down and that they were basically become their forever home, you know, if we do not increase our, you know, the capability of the Civic Center, then we will not be able to actually host them, and we may lose them. Uh, additionally, uh, you know, every weekend, this weekend as many as others, you know, we have parents and grandparents that basically become professional sports chauffeurs for children all over the, you know, all over the area. And they're going to El Paso, they're going to the DFW area, they're going to um, Oklahoma City because they're hosting tournaments that we could host here. NCAA uh, in track field and basketball are are actually interested in Amarillo and would like to be here, but we do not have the facilities available for them to use. And so we're not able to, to have that. If we had, if we were able to do the improvements which we'd hope, we'd actually be able to host that. We'd be able to host NCAA basketball here. We'd be able to host other things such as volleyball, wrestling matches. Not only would we be able to bring in money from visitors from outside, from teams, but we'd also be able to have our own citizens be able to stay here and not have to travel as often, which is very important. Uh, we just did an analysis with integrated marking media, and if with the new improvements that are suggested, uh, th makes us have a ability to have 7,800 more uh, conventions and uh, programs that we would be able to bid on, we'd be actually competitive for, which, which would be substantial. Even if we got you know, even out of the 7,800, you know, 2% of, if, you know, we're successful for 2% of those bids, that gives us 156 more conventions that would be here. Uh, then we'll move on to concerts, which are also another thing. Um, again, as mentioned before, with our ceilings at 38 feet, we do not have the capacity anymore. So we've lost out on a number of concerts, uh, including Marvel Uni uh, Universe Live, both the floor size and the steel height. Um, and then capacity for place for people like uh, Robert Plant, Leonard Skinner, uh, Mercy Me again was the height, and Share was both uh, was the was the height as well. If we're able to do the improvements, what we would like to do, we'll become much more competitive. We'll be at the industry standard, so we'll be actually able to host a number of different types of artists as well. People like Blake Shelton, L L Luke Combs, Alan Jackson, and uh, my personal favorite would be Jimmy Buffett. But, uh, you know, we cannot, we will never be able to do that if we are constrained by what we have now. Thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Sherman Bass. I am the general manager of the Amarillo Civic Center Complex. And it's my pleasure to tell you a little bit about the project. Uh, first, this was not an overnight concept. It began over eight years ago when the city engaged Decker Perrick Sabatini to conduct a needs assessment for us. And the first volume focused on the existing facility assessment and the market analysis. And while it recommended the need and demand for an expansion and a new arena, vol volume two contained a master plan and financial analysis that was focused on the expansion and renovation of the convention center space. Uh, volume three focused on the new arena, and the current phase has confirmed the need and the demand and represents a combined project with a master plan and financial analysis. A city-appointed executive committee that you've met a few members of today uh, is made up of five citizens, 
and it was established to independently review the needs assessment and provide feedback on options, and it's been meeting since this past January. The previous volumes analyzed multiple options for the expansion, for the renovation, and for a new arena location. And the concept being presented today represents years of study from industry experts, citizens, staff, and Civic Center Complex users. And most recently, the entire vision has been refined by the Executive Committee to share with you today. All of the recommendations are made to, <clears throat> excuse me, are made to accomplish several goals, including improving the guest experience, improving our lessee experience, providing facilities that appeal to both promoters and meeting planners to increase Amarillo's ability to attract and retain quality events, improve the quality of life for our citizens, and increase the economic impact of this facility on our community. The current footprint of the Amarillo Civic Center complex is on the screen, and the concept addresses that need for a modern expansion and renovation of the convention center, a new iconic arena, and a three and a half acre park, park anchored by the Civic Center, Arena, and Hodgetown. Again, multiple sites were evaluated for the new arena, including off-site, north of the Civic Center, further east on Johnson, uh, of Johnson, and the site that's being recommended today. While we've heard a little bit about the limitations of our current facility, I'd like to focus on highlights of the project, which provide solutions, including a 75,000 square foot exhibit hall immediately east of the north end of the facility, a 30,000 square foot ballroom on an expanded site of the current north exhibit hall, true separation of the front of house and guest experience and the back of house and service areas through a large pre-function space and main entrance at approximately 4th and Buchanan, and a true back of house extending three blocks on the east side of the facility. It includes full service kitchens, modern concession areas, state-of-the-art technology, and inviting spaces. The new arena is anticipated to seat 10,100 in maximum capacity and 8,900 end stage. I want to focus on that for just a moment. We've had a lot of feedback about the size of the arena. Uh, not only has the data supported that size of a facility for our market area, including room for growth, but we've also talked to multiple promoters of large shows, and 8,900 will be competitive for large concerts and family shows. The arena steel height that David mentioned that, that keeps us out of so many concerts and shows would be set at least an industry standard of 60 feet. The arena provides large load in and load out area, a large marshalling area, and connects to the Coliseum. That's very important. It would make us unique in the United States. Outside of educational facilities and educational institutions, we have yet to find a community that has a Coliseum or, or two arenas uh, attached. Uh, they'll be attached both at the participant level and at the spectator level allowing for instance we have four youth hockey tournaments a year they could double in size using both facilities and participants and and the spectators can go back and forth seamlessly it includes new locker rooms dressing rooms offices catering media av areas etc if you go on the tour later you'll hear me talk about it but currently we have two team dressing rooms that have plumbing uh, bathrooms showers etc and those same two areas are the areas that our, our guest artists, famous entertainers, use for their dressing rooms. And unfortunately, um, besides the appearance, there's definitely an odor that is not expected in a dressing room that you might expect in a locker room. The plan does call for relocation of City Hall in order to accommodate the arena and a large park and green space in the heart of the downtown entertainment district. It too would be anchored by the Hodgetown Arena and the Civic Center. The plan includes development of the historic Santa Fe Depot as part of the Amarillo Civic Center complex. The depot, depot will provide us the opportunity to lease very unique event space. It doesn't look like a ballroom, it looks like a depot. And we anticipate it being a popular area for receptions, parties, etc. We'll also have the potential uh, to lease it for other tourist-focused businesses, such as a restaurant, museum, or shops. 
Well, that's it for this stage of my report. This does come at a cost, and Kevin's coming up to share that with you. Good morning. My name is Kevin Starbuck, and I'm the assistant city manager and the project lead for the city on this project. As Sherman's alluded, any grand vision for the next 50 years comes at a cost. Um, the cost of this project has been calculated through our needs assessment as $319 million. That covers all aspects of the project, including all the infrastructure improvements required to support this large facility. As you see up on the screen, we have it broken down. The new arena, the renovation and expansion of the Civic Center space, the relocation of city services, the addition of a parking garage, the addition of um, the Santa Fe Depot restoration, and the creation of, an, of a large park space. Each one of those comes at a cost as part of this project, and both national and local construction estimates have been used to come up with a calculation for that particular cost. What is being asked is that this will be presented to the voters. It is gonna be purely up to the voters as to whether we move forward with this project or not. It is not something that is in the hands of the city council or of city staff. It is something that will be presented in May of 2020 in a bond election for the voters to consider the merits of this project. What will be on the ballot in May of 2020 is a $279 million ask for the construction of this particular facility proposed. That may change as we are having this conversation. We may get feedback on aspects of the project that don't resonate with the community, don't resonate with the public. And that's why it is so important for you to provide us that feedback as we have cast a vision and now it's your opportunity to visit with us about whether we're hitting the mark or missing the mark on this project. But as it's conceived, a $279 million bond will be on the May 2020 election for consideration. Many of you will ask, where's the other 40 million come from? Three sources are where we're looking for that. The first of which is the city council will be asked to pass a $17 million additional debt to fund the relocation of city services. That's not something that we can include in the voter initiative, but it would be covered under the, uh, the city council issuing additional debt to cover that particular portion. Through our experience in the construction of Hodgetown and other major projects, we believe we can trim 15 million through value engineering out of the project. Different aspects of the project that we can gain opportunity to save the taxpayer in the project as we develop it. The last piece is that we would have to do infrastructure improvements in the area of the Civic Center for both water, sewer, and drainage, and all of those would be covered under costs associated with those departments that they do in a year-in and year-out basis through their capital programs. Still being paid by the taxpayers, but being covered through their annual allocations of capital projects within that. And that's how we come up with the funding to create this $319 million facility. What that means to the taxpayers is a substantial change on your property taxes. The property taxes as we are calculating it would increase by 15.1 cents for the average taxpayer. And I say average taxpayer, all taxpayers, um, with exceptions. The exceptions being those that are uh, eligible for both age, 65 or older, or disability exemptions has been established through, by the voters several years ago that your property taxes are frozen, so there would be no impact on you. What 15.1 cents means on your property taxes is for a $100,000 valuation, $150.85 a year, or $12.57 a month. The reason we use a $100,000 valuation, I'm sure every one of you are sitting in here saying, well, my house isn't $100,000. Why are you using $100,000? It makes it a very easy denominator to calculate what your tax impact will be. If your house is an $85,000 house, you multiply it by 0.85. If it's a $200,000 house, you multiply it by two, and you can very quickly come up with what your particular tax impact would be related to the funding of this project. So what we've outlined is our process for funding this project. And it's this opportunity for you to consider, is this the right project for us, for our community? 
I would allow that on our Conversation Civic Center website, if you would like to determine your exact impact related to property taxes, we do have a property tax calculator on the website, and it gives you that opportunity to go there and plug in the valuation of your house based on the appraisal value from, from Prad and make a determination on what your property tax impact would be. I understand this is not the good news portion of the presentation, but it's very important that we make it very clear to the taxpayer how are we funding this project and what is the impact on you uh, as a part of this project. So thank you very much. Good morning. I'm Rod Schroeder, uh, retired superintendent of AISD, and I'm also a member of the executive committee. I'm so happy to have you here uh, to listen to this presentation and then to provide your input. Uh, as numerous people have said, it's very important that we hear from you. Uh, it's been my privilege to serve on this, this committee. Uh, just so you know, we weren't asked to be on this committee just because we would be a yes vote. Uh, we were given uh, latitude to disagree and to ask questions and and we certainly did as we worked through uh, these concepts and I want to tell you that um, you have a really good staff here in the city um, I knew them by name but now I know them in based based upon their work ethic and their competence and their excellence in what they try to do for us we had a lot of needs a lot of questions and they were uh, very attentive to providing for us the information that we needed. The big question for us was, w will this facility bring in any return on investment, or what would the return on investment be? And uh, we really wanted to know that, so we asked a number of, uh, of experts uh, in the city to, to look at that, and they came up with what they believe are uh, appropriate and correct pro projections for what we could expect uh, with a return on investment, a tangible return on investment, I would say. Uh, as you can see by this slide, uh, they predict that we would have 85 additional events that could be scheduled in this facility. That is a 17% increase in events, but that 17% increase turns into 171,000 new attendees to the, uh, to the events that are sponsored, uh, which is a 41% 41% increase uh, from today's baseline. And that would also uh, generate uh, 33,000 additional room nights uh, for the city, and that's an 80% increase. <clears throat> all in all, in dollar amounts, that will turn into an additional $28.4 million in economic impact, which is a 79% increase uh, for the city. So you can see that the impact is substantial. We believe it's substantial. <clears throat> Now this event, as has been alluded to, will host a number of, of events. Obviously being superintendent, I'm sort of interested in the youth activities. And there are a lot of them that could be sponsored here, volleyball, basketball, hockey, wrestling, um, gymnastics, tumbling, so on and so forth. <clears throat> I want to highlight one that I know particularly uh, a lot about, and that's volleyball. Um, Amarillo across the state is known for its volleyball programs, both private and public. We've won many state championships and whenever you go across the, the state, you mentioned volleyball, everybody knows about Amarillo. That's because uh, of the good programs we have but also because of the club opportunities we have for our kids to play. Um, my daughter played volleyball. She was uh, played at Amarillo High School and played in the club program. But as a club participant, as, and as a family, I had to come up with about $6,000 a year. Now, this was 20 years ago. $6,000 a year for cost to travel to spend in other cities across the state. Why do they travel so much? It's because of the strength of competition. You get chances to compete against high-level volleyball teams across the nation, literally. And so it's important that our kids have that kind of experience. And I went uh, clearly to the surrounding states, but I've been to the East Coast and West Coast, Louisville and uh, Indianapolis, and those kinds of places, just to try to find strong competition. Uh, a common discussion among all the parents is, gosh, we wish we could have something like that here. The reason we couldn't have it here is because of our facilities. These uh, big tournaments have dozens of courts out 
for multiple teams and simultaneous matches going on all the time. And it's two and three day events. So there is a lot of activity. Well, that generates a lot of economic impact for those. And so my $6,000 went to help other cities uh, across the, the nation here. So I'm excited about this facility because this will allow us uh, to actually sponsor one or maybe even two of these big events and bring teams in. Now, there's one other aspect to this that I think is important. You know, I, I'm keenly aware of our north and east sides of town and, and the economically uh, disadvantaged situations that some of them find themselves in. They can't come up with six, $8,000 to do this for their children. But their children are, can be just as good athletes as anybody on the west side of town or people who participate in these. But they need the opportunity to play. And this facility would give us that opportunity to allow some of those uh, areas to organize local teams, local club teams, and play here against good competition. So I think that's a possibility that, that we need to consider, and I think it's an equity issue. Now I mentioned the tangible return on investment. There's also an intangible return on investment. And what I mean by that is Amarillo's brand name, uh, customer satisfaction, ex customer experience, uh, the citizen loyalty and citizen pride in, in having a facility like this. You know, some cities um, attract people and some cities repel people. You probably have a list of cities you, and you like to visit and you also have some you say, I really don't want to go back there anymore. Amarillo needs to be one of those cities you say, I want to come back. We want Amarillo to be a destination city and we have some things going for us in that regard. <clears throat> Uh, when you look at those types of cities, uh, there are lots of reasons why people want to return, uh, you know, climate, uh, the, e in, the ingress and egress of, of the city itself, attractions, events, so on, the people. But I think a, a city that is a magnet for people uh, is a city that you sense a, an, a, an, an innovation and an improvement in the city culture. Uh, those kinds of cities uh, are what attract people because they think this city is trying to take care of its citizens and is providing for its citizens. They're, they're forward thinking as opposed to stagnant. I think that um, this project can do that for Amarillo. I think it can improve our brand, increase our citizen satisfaction and pride and experience for all of us. One thing we do know for sure, the status quo is not an option. Uh, we're either moving forward or we're moving backward. And this became very clear to me as a, as a member of the executive committee. If we do nothing, the, f the future will not stay stable like it is right now. It's going to drop off. This facility will continue to deteriorate. We will fall, fall further behind our competition and the economic impact won't stay at $36 million. It's going to drop, and let me give you an example. The Working Ranch Rodeo Association, Cowboys Association, WRCA, hosts a rodeo event here every year. That event is the culmination of 23 regional rodeos across the nation. And 23 is the number that they, that they can't grow beyond because of the facility. They bring winners from those uh, rodeos, regional rodeos to Amarillo for the world championship. They would like to grow that, but they can't grow it because our space is not, the space is not here. And so uh, six million dollars comes into our economy with that one event. Two days ago they had their board meeting and in front of their board they had three proposals from three different cities asking them to move that event to their facility and what they would provide to that, uh, that organization. They want to stay in Amarillo, but if we do not do something, they are going to be forced, if they want to grow, uh, to move to another venue. <laughs> you know, I'm, I'm proud of Amarillo people. Um, past accomplishments have demonstrated that we have a city full of thoughtful, uh, generous people who will spend for the common good, for the current uh, citizens, but also for the future. We've got to be thinking about this future. And when I think about that statement, I, I think about what has happened in the past. David mentioned the 1964 uh, election. 
And the challenge that those people had in this face of economic, you know, impact with the base leaving, to make a decision to vote for something. I think of the medical center. I was here when Northwest was moved from its old location out to the new location and people thought about building a medical complex out there. And I know people said, what in the world's going on? Look at what has happened to that. I was a superintendent, or not, I wasn't a superintendent, but I was in AISD when we built the um, activity centers at our four high schools. And the criticism of those is you're building Taj Mahals. Now, that's what people told us. Look how those activity centers have been utilized by thousands of kids in this city over the course of years. We believe this kind of event can do the same kind of thing. We believe that this event or this facility will be another part of the story and the legacy of the Amarillo citizens looking forward into the future. Thank you. Well, I'm happy to come back and share some uh, uh, design concepts with you. Many of you have seen them. You may have the book already in front of you or have seen them online or even the photos around the room. <clears throat> this first photo is at 6th and Buchanan approaching the park with the arena in the background. And you can see it's, it's quite an iconic building. I believe this arena would put us on the map with promoters and agents across the United States. Uh, the, <clears throat> a little bit closer in the park facing the arena, I'll point out that is a 120 degree video wall on the ex, uh, outside of the building. Uh, again, closer approaching the arena, you can see a, a spot for a team store for our, our, our in-house teams. Then entering the lobby of the arena, a, again, technology being a very important aspect of the design concept. Uh, the following slide is the arena in a rodeo setup and then the arena and a concert set up. And then I'd like to move down to the north end of the building where the convention center entrance is uh, on this slide. And then as you go inside, that pre-function space I described, uh, we are really lacking in the convention and meeting industry uh, to be able to provide modern and industry standard facilities. And this, this really tr truly will be an iconic and uh, as, as Rod said, an attractor for these conventions and major events in the new arena. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming out. I tell you, I get super excited about this. I'm Julie Sims. I'm one of the executive committee people, and I have had a blast learning about this and learning about my city and learning about who comes into our city. It has been such a joy to hear all these vendors talk about how much they enjoy working with our Civic Center staff and how much they love Amarillo. We should be very, very proud as citizens of our city. And I, I want to tell you, I'm a mother of six, and I am telling you that these, our children are wanting to move home. They want to come back to where they were raised. My three oldest are millennials. They graduated college. They went out. They've been working in other cities. And about two years ago, the three oldest all moved home. They said, we want to come home. We love Amarillo. We love living here. And we want to raise our families here. Think about it. Amarillo is one of those places that you can, you could literally have your kids walk around the corner and go to the public school there. I'm at my high school reunion this year, uh, this weekend. I'm fixing to go back to it. And I just, you know, I think about all these people who've come back. And I have gone to school with them from first grade to high school. And we went to the Amarillo High Pep Rally yesterday. And just as Rod said, that facility was packed with people enjoying and using that activity center. And I thought, Rod's right. He's absolutely right. And just the excitement of what was going on in that pep rally for their homecoming game. And, and as I think about this project, our lives are so much more than just the daily grind. It's what do we do when we get off of work? It's what do we do on the weekends? And how do we spend our life with our family?
A couple of weeks ago, over Labor Day, I got to go to Denver to visit my son who moved there for a new job right after college, and they were having a, the taste of Denver, and it was on the front lawn of the Capitol, and they had food trucks out there, and they had vendors, and the event was free to everyone. Anybody could come. The place was packed. The place was packed. And they had brought in Cool and the Gang, and they brought in Casey and the Sunshine Band, and they were having this glorious outdoor concert, and everyone was having a great time. There was a little family in front of us, mom, dad, and three little kids. And I mean, we are all shake, 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 shake your booty. And I mean, magic was happening right there. We were making community, and they didn't even know we weren't locals. Didn't matter. Everyone was having such a great time, and it was just such a safe environment. So when I look at this, I can totally see Casey and the Sunshine Band on that stage. Think of what we could have, and something like this offers something for anyone to come free. There's all kinds of potential here, just in this courtyard, and just the beauty of it. I've had the opportunity to go over and take a tour of our Santa Fe Depot. I'm telling you, that is a solid building. Solid. It will be here for another 50 plus years. If there's a tornado, you need to run down there and get inside of it. You'll be safe. But the history that is inside that building, I was just like, this is amazing. Those doors need to be opened so that people can come in and see the history that is in that building. And there is so much potential. That whole piece just gets me super, super excited about what we're doing downtown and how we're revitalizing it. And I think about our city. Really, this panhandle area is booming. My husband was just at the ribbon cutting for the Texas Tech Veterinarian School. How about that? What an awesome addition to our city. And, you know, I can think about it. We've gotten the Texas Tech Pharmacy School. We came with the Texas Tech Medical School. My husband trained through that. And we're so happy to have them here. Now the vet school. We just got to go down to Canyon and be at the first football game in that brand new stadium. And I'm telling you, some magic happened down there. The student section was so excited about their new stadium. And after the game, one of the football players goes running over to their fan section, the student section, because he wanted to high-five them because they had won their game in the first in that new stadium. And it was like the whole team caught on, and they ran over there, and they were just celebrating with their student body. And it was one of those moments where we're like, I'm not going to forget this. This is why we live. It's those moments where we're doing community together and we're enjoying life together, and we're having those life experiences like the graduations, like remembering the first concert you went to in this building. Mine, Bobby Sherman, if you even have a clue who he was. Oh, yeah, thank you. There's someone in the back who even remembers Bobby Sherman. But, you know, we have those kind of memories of, yeah, I, rem I remember going to that, you know, or I remember going to Trans-Siberian Orchestra, and we would take our office staff and be blown away by the light show and the musicianship. They were incredible. And they haven't been back for years. Why are they not here? They're awesome. They're awesome. And so this kind of facility, the, the arena, oh my gosh, is that not fabulous? This is where we live life past our jobs and the daily grind. And this is where we live life with our families. My children and all these millennials, I tell you, I've, uh, a veterinarian, a young veterinarian just moved home. One of the new optometrists came to the meeting, and he came to us. He said, what do I do to get involved? I want to be in on this. He said, I've just moved back with my family. We're going to make our practice here. I want to be involved with what's going on in the city because they are all excited about where they live. And that's a huge part of the factor of why we live here. You know, you should like where you live. You should be proud of your city, and you should feel like your city is moving forward, and that we are progressing, and that life is getting better and better. My uh, father-in-law, he, uh, he had a shop, and he had a saying. He had one rule about that shop. He said, if you use it, anyone's free to come use it. He said, but you better leave it better than you found it. You know? You were free to use it, but if you use one of his tools, 
You needed to clean it up and put it back in its proper place. And he said, and then go the extra mile. Sweep it up, you know, wipe it up, keep it neat for the next person to come in. That's exactly what we need to do with this civic center and this area. We as citizens have the responsibility and the leadership to leave our civic center better than we found it. Thank you so much for coming. We hope you take the tour. Trust me, the tour is a little convincing. Just go through those locker rooms. <laughs> but anyhow, please take the tour. Thank you for coming out, and we're so glad that you came. Jordan? Ah. Thank you, Julie. Um, I know we're kind of asking everybody to drink from the fire hose here, and there's a lot to unpack in all this information. So um, we've had great feedback and great response so far. Some people agree, some disagree, but the point is we're getting the information that we need. And I want to uh, ask Kevin to just address some of the main questions that we are continually getting. And then um, I'll talk to you a little bit more about where you can get more information and we'll get the tour going for those of you who are ready to get back to your Saturdays. But Kevin, just to kind of talk about some of the main themes that we're hearing, uh, one big question we're getting is, the arena size of 10,000 seats, 10,100 seats. It's too big, it's too small. Um, how did we pick that number? How did that number come to, uh, into the proposal? Well, so with, with every aspect of the project, we've engaged in a process through the needs assessment of, of visiting with industry experts on what is the right size for our community. There are the many people, as, as Sherman alluded, that would say we should build one as big as Lubbock, 15,000 seats, or we've even heard the American Airlines Center in, in Dallas, 20,000 seats. It just doesn't make sense for our community. And, and the analysis that HVS, which is an industry expert, has done says that that eight to 10,000 is a sweet spot. It's the right fit for our community. It's where artists that come to Amarillo want to play a full house. So we could build for a full house for once every 10 years, or we can build for the potential for a full house once every month. And it's from that perspective that that eight to 10,000 is a sweet spot um, that works for the industry. It's where the industry is going. It's where artists want to be so that they can very quickly move in, set up their shows in, in, a, in a large arena that, that seats that many, perform their show, have a successful event that entertains our community, and then move down the road to the next show. Um, so it's from that perspective that 8 to 10,000 is the right size as the market analysis goes for our market. The other aspect of it is, is if we go beyond that 8 to 10,000 seat capacity and we look at a 12, 13, 14, 15,000 seat arena, we put ourselves in the position of exponentially increasing the construction cost because we're having to add a second or third tier of seating to the arena to, to accommodate that. Uh, so the, the footprint of the bowl is such that, that in effect, it, it's able to be housed within one tier of seating. So to go beyond our capacity that we're proposing would mean that we would have to add that second tier, which means additional steel, additional uh, concrete costs, additional engineering costs that go into it, uh, not to mention elevators and, and escalators and the things that, that move people into those higher levels of the arena, and really just changes the dynamic of the project dramatically. So it's for all of those reasons that the proposal stayed with that eight to 10,000 seat capacity as being where we felt we were at the right point to service our community, to provide for the future, but also be in the right spot for the market. Okay, thank you. And then another question we're getting quite often is, as people look at the renderings and read through the material, it's very obvious that there's something missing. And what's missing is City Hall. So City Hall is no longer where it is now. Uh, so we get the question, in fact, just on our Facebook live feed today, even somebody said, what's gonna happen with City Hall? Where's it gonna go? That is something as city staff we've worked very diligently to address. So you notice that there was a cost of $20 million in the project to relocate city services. What that's going to do is we've looked at what departments do we currently have in City Hall, and two departments in particular, our utility billing and our parks and recreation, our departments that interact with the public, that's where the vast majority of people that come to City Hall, if you're not coming for a city council meeting, that's, you're probably coming there to pay your water bill, or you're coming to reserve a park or, or register your sports team, et cetera. So those two departments we are looking to relocate to an existing building on Johnson Street that we will remodel, and we will look to create an opportunity for better customer service. Today, if you come to pay your water bill, you have no opportunity to uh, use a drive-through or anything along those lines. You're, you're really, your only opportunity if you come to City Hall is to get, 
get out of the car, come inside, pay your water bill uh, that way. So this new facility will provide us that opportunity to have a drive-through to better service those in our community that, that, that uh, prefer to pay their bills in person. It will also provide us an opportunity to have Parks and Rec in there. So if you want to come reserve a park or register a sports team, you can do that through that facility and have much easier access to those services that those two departments provide. The remaining departments in City Hall would be relocated to an existing building in the downtown area. And we've been in conversations with multiple facilities. Every one of them are existing buildings in the downtown area. Our plan is not, there is no plan to build a new building in downtown related to City Hall. We are looking to utilize existing buildings in the downtown area through either a lease or purchase agreement where we would relocate those remaining services of City Hall to those buildings and, and that would be the new City Hall for, for our community. So it's a necessary part of the project from the perspective that the arena and the park space, in order to create that dynamic, we have to get City Hall out of the way. And the truth is, the City Hall is just as old or older than the Civic Center and is already in this position where we're going to have to have a major capital investment in the facility if we're going to continue to use it. So we're a good crossroads related to the Civic Center to make the, or related to City Hall to make these types of decisions on the future of that facility. Okay. And then kind of the final theme is we keep telling everybody this, this is a conversation. We want to hear from you. We want your feedback. So if we're telling people um, that we're, we're still moving into the planning and there's still a lot to this proposal that exists and doesn't exist, they're asking me, well, what does exist? What contracts are in place? What's already been done that can't be undone? So where are we at in this process? At this point, there are no contracts in place. And it's very important that we can't move forward until the voters approve this. Uh, so while we are, we are working a plan and we have developed a proposal that we're presenting to the community, it is the opportunity for the community to come and give us their feedback on what makes sense within the project, what doesn't make sense to you within the project. And it should be up to us as a committee, uh, both the executive committee and city staff, to be able to answer those questions and explain why we are doing different aspects of the project. So. This is truly designed to be a conversation with our community. We want your feedback. We want to hear from you about what works, what doesn't work, and what we need to, to maybe modify the project or keep it as it is as a proposal to present to the voters. So we welcome your input, and we, we look forward to this ongoing conversation as we move forward. The other aspect is as you look at these design concepts, it's not set in stone. This may change as we get into that architectural and engineering phase. Um, these are being put together by industry experts, people who do this for a living, to present to us a very positive, inviting environment for our future of our facility. Maybe you don't like the, the, the color of the carpet, or, or you think there should be more grass in the green space. None of that has been decided yet. Every bit of that is providing a framework of what this will look like into the future. Okay, thank you, Kevin. As Kevin mentioned several times, uh, we are very interested in the feedback on this proposal. So I'm going to just outline very briefly a couple ways that you can do that. The first, probably most important way is through, excuse me, the website conversationciviccenter.com. On that website, you will find all of the renderings, all of the financial information, various studies that, that have been done on the project, and there's a contact page where you can directly email us a question or a comment or a concern. There's also a button that says request a presentation, and if you click that button, that'll also generate an email to us letting us know that your organization or your, your committees or your neighborhood groups are interested in us coming to you to do this presentation. So we want to make this as easy as possible to get the information out. So please uh, take, a, take some time to look at that website and get yourself familiar with uh, the frequently asked questions that are there and everything else. Um, in the back of the room are question cards. You can write a comment or a, or a question on the cards and drop it in our boxes in the back if you'd like. We will also stay here for as long as we need to today to answer questions. If anybody would like to come up and ask a question, that would be great. Um, there are sign-up sheets in the back where you can put your email down, and I tell people we will not spam you, but we will survey you and ask you what you think of the project within the next couple of uh, the next week or two. So if you'd like to share that, that's a way to stay up to date as well. Um, Finally, we're going to have the tour starting here shortly back in the corner of the room there. If you're interested in seeing the facility, that's a great place to uh, head that direction and a, and a great tour uh, for those that are interested in seeing the current conditions of the, um, of the Civic Center. So I think I've covered everything. Again, we'll be up here for questions if anybody has any. And I just want to thank you again for spending part of your Saturday morning with us. And um, you all have a good day. Thank you.